Looking back, 2000 might have been the year most defined by the internet. Well, it had been rapidly growing since 95. 2000 was the year when the internet began to become mainstream. And the prime example of this wave of popularity were the commercials of the Super Bowl that year. The 1999 Super Bowl had two commercials for internet products, but 2000s had 17. That's a massive jump in a year's time. And among the crowd was one commercial for Pets.com. Pets.com began in 1998 with a novel idea. What if a pet store was online? That was a unique concept for the time in isolation, as there were already plenty of pet retailers on the web. It was stiff competition for Pets.com, so how did they rise to the top? Well, the answer is kind of complicated. You see, you gotta just... Amazon, along with some other investors, invested over $10 million into Pets.com in March 1999. With all this money in hands, the company puts it to good use by spending it on improving their infrastructure and advertising. Throughout the rest of 1999, Pets.com ran a wildly successful advertising campaign. The most remembered ads were the TV commercials, starring the sock puppet. I don't see the appeal myself, but apparently the public of 1999-2000 did. And so, Pets.com and his mascot soon became icons of internet culture. The peak of this was at Super Bowl 34, when the company spent $1.2 million on a 30 second ad. That's a lot of money, so they must have been swimming in this stuff, right? Right? So yeah, Pets.com was popular, but not successful. In 1999, they earned $619,000, which wouldn't be that bad for a first year company, until they realized it's only revenue, and they spent $11.8 million on advertising. That's not good, like at all. By fall 2000, things were looking bleak for Pets.com, as their stock price was rapidly sinking. Despite this, the company declined offers from other companies to be bought out. The final straw for them was when the dot-com bubble bursted. Basically, Pets.com's investors were pulling out en masse, and they didn't have enough money to survive without them. So, on November 9th, the company went under. The domain and assets for Pets.com were later sold to PetSmart. Or is it PetSmart or Pets... I don't fucking know. We still use the Pets.com websites to this day. As for the sock puppet, he was sold to Bar None Inc. in 2002, who would later use him in some commercials that year. Also, he got sued for $20 million, capitalism at its finest. As of 2022, Pets.com is most remembered for being the mascot of the dot-com bubble, but it also laid the groundwork for what not to do as a pet retailer. Pets.com trips so websites like Chewy could run. As I mentioned earlier, 2000 was the year of the internet, so lots of people were getting brand new computers to surf the net. There was a problem though, the people buying the computers were first time users. Instead of hobbyists and people we call nerds, it was drannies and kids who had little to no experience with computers at all. Microsoft noticed this and decided to capitalize on this market with Windows Me, and yes, that is how you pronounce it. The main draw to me was how user friendly it was, even though 98 and arguably 95 were pretty damn user friendly. It had some helpful improvements like system restore points and a more in depth troubleshooter. But the big change that Microsoft wanted everyone to know was the inclusion of the new Windows Media Suite. This set included programs like Windows Media Player, Windows Movie Maker, and new online games. These were all included to lure in noobs like a van marked with free candy. Literally all of the advertising and marketing for me revolved around these programs and how good it was for the internet. You may think this all sounds decent enough, so why is me included in this video? It's simple really. Me is pretty fucking there. Like it exists, sure, but it has zero substance to it. It's the embodiment of mediocre. If you were using 98 or 95, me had little going for it, and many of the new features either existed in 98 second edition or had similar programs from third parties that could do the same things but better. It didn't help matters that me removed real DOS mode. If you're unaware, all Windows versions before me were built on top of MS DOS in order to maintain legacy support. Basically, you could play the original version of Doom on 98 without any problems, but on a me, there would be problems. For example, you want mouse support? Sorry, bucko. Keyboard is the best me can do. This pissed a lot of people off because unless you got the NT version of the Windows, it was expected that you could just nope out of Windows and go back to DOS and play like DOS Mega Man or some shit. The removal of real DOS was done because it apparently sped up loading time by like 10 seconds. 
Aside from all that, Windows Me is also known for its instability and its lifetime support. Windows Me was the primary and up-to-date OS from summer 2000 to September 2001. Damn. So yeah, if you know the Windows timeline, you would have seen this coming from like a mile away. But Windows XP released in 2001 and left me in the dust. People who stayed with 98 switched over because not only did XP have all of Mii's features, but it also had new features that people enjoyed and found really useful. XP updated and introduced stuff we take for granted nowadays, like the start menu. I should also mention that XP was visually a bigger jump than me. Me looks nearly identical to 98 to the naked eye, but XP looks like OS X in comparison. In its last days, Me was neglected and brushed off by many people until mainstream support ended right before 2004 and full support ended in July 2006. To put this into perspective, 98 ended support on the same day and XP lasted until 2014, 13 years after its release. There's still some people using XP as their main OS to this day, but me is usually only used so people can make videos about it being the worst version of Windows alongside Vista 8 and probably 11 by now. Like all of those though, me has little to no fans still kicking around, making it one of the loneliest Windows releases ever. At least it has Beck, I guess. Now this one's just sad. Sega in the late 90s was not doing too well. Their latest console, the Saturn, was a modest success in the East, but a massive failure everywhere else. Like it failed so bad that Sega of America execs were telling people the Saturn wasn't their future within two years of its lifespan. Basically, the Saturn wasn't hit, so Sega began work on their new console, which released in late 1998 as the Sega Dreamcast. But wait! Isn't that too early for the scope of this vid DL though? Yes, Texas Speech Sonic. But I'm talking about it here because the Dreamcast released in the States on September 9th, 1999, which is a pretty epic date, all things considered. When it released, the cast was way ahead of the competition in graphics and processing power. It made the PlayStation and the N64 look ancient in comparison and had built-in online features. Previously, online gaming on a console was basically not existent, save for some obscure add-ons that were, to put it nicely, awful. But the Dreamcast had a basic modem built right into it. From what I've heard, it was decent for the time, but leagues better than what came before. Aside from playing online, you could also browse the net and even download DLC. Yes. DLC in 1999, even if it was already on the disc, which is pretty fucking bad. But that actually brings us to the VMU. This little thing is the Dreamcast's take on a memory card. It holds data like, well, every other memory card, but it also doubles as a micro game console. While it was really simple, it was still a console that you got with another console. But it wasn't all perfect though, as they held less than a megabyte of data. In total, it had 128 kilobytes but only about 100 are available to use without hacking. To give you an idea of how small this is, there's NES games that wouldn't fit on a single VMU. You could get bigger sized ones, but only the base model had a screen. In its first year and a half, the Dreamcast was doing really well. It was selling much better than the Saturn, and was being supported by a lot of developers and publishers. It truly looked like this was the future of gaming, until this little thing came along and destroyed its world. Even before the US launch, the Dreamcast lived in the shadow of the PS2. The original PlayStation was the king of the fifth generation by a long shot, so everyone was excited to see what the PS2 would do. PS2 first released in Japan on March 4th, 2000, and within a month, it had overtaken the Dreamcast. It sold 1.4 million units in its first month, and by the time it launched in the US, it had moved three and a half. Sega began to worry a little bit. They started to cut the Dreamcast price in a last ditch effort, but you can only do so much to save a failing console. Once small profits turned to damaging losses. There was one last hope for the Dreamcast though. The PS2 US launch had a problem with shortages across the country. Sega thought this would boost Dreamcast sales since, you know, it's the next best thing. But it turns out that most people would rather wait for a restock to get something they didn't want in the first place. By the start of 2001, Dreamcast sales had 
plummeted, and Sagan knew their ship was sinking. After some infighting at the company, they came to the conclusion that this console ship was not working out. And so, on March 31st, 2001, Sega announced their departure from the console industry. By this point, Dreamcasts were selling for cheap. I do mean cheap. They were selling at the price of $50. While some games did come out in 2001 and 2002, it really started to get lonely after the Xbox and GameCube came out. For the rest of the 2000s, Sega would shift to an entirely software-focused company, except for the arcades, where they actually did make some like arcade machine hardware, but that kind of doesn't count though. One of the more ironic releases is Sonic Advance. This marked the first time that Sega's own mascot was on the console of their first rival, and it wouldn't be the last. Nowadays, the Dreamcast is fondly remembered by many people. It had good games and was really ahead of its time in retrospect. Due to how easy it is to run pirated games on the Dreamcast, there's actually a lot of homebrew and even some like actual retail games coming out for it to this day. As for the PS2, it would go on to become the most successful console of all time, selling about 154 million units. The reason the PS2 probably sold better was due to its DVD drive. Back in the 2000s, DVD players were pretty fucking expensive, but this $300 gaming console that also doubled as a DVD player was really appealing to people, so it sold really fucking well. Maybe the Dreamcast could have sold as well if it had a DVD drive, but who knows if Sega would even be in the console race today. As of 2022, Sega is still a major company in Japan, but less so outside of there. I don't know, they still release some good games every once in a while. Thanks for watching. Subscribers, some shit. Be sure to check out all my other videos if I if you think I'm good enough. You probably don't if you're still watching. Sorry for not uploading last month. Um, I've just not had the time to work on these videos and stuff. But hopefully I can get back to monthly uploads or something. But I don't know. See you guys later.